chapter. Romans chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Romans 1, 1. The Bible says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And now for the next 16 chapters, we find Paul elaborating on that one verse. Essentially, the entire book of Romans is, is uh, prefaced here, obviously, in verse number 1, but where it says that Paul is called to be an apostle and that he is separated to the gospel of God. And so the gospel of God is the theme of the book of Romans. And all throughout the book of Romans, we find teaching and, and preaching and doctrine and principles all surrounding this idea of the gospel of God. That is the theme of the book of Romans. And I think if, if, I, were, uh, if I were wanting to preach on something, to be my very first message, I guess you could say, as the pastor of a church, I don't think I could pick a better subject than the gospel of God. I don't think I could pick another topic. I don't think there's anything else that would interest me or you or interest God any more than preaching on His gospel. Uh, preaching His good news, that's what the gospel is, right? The word gospel, it means good news. And God has some good news for us tonight. It's okay, you can smile. God has some good news for you. There's some things that are in the Word of God that are something to smile about and something to be happy about and something to be excited for. And that's what the book of Romans is all about. It is about the gospel of God. And if you're saved, you would say, well, I already know the gospel. Uh, I've already experienced the gospel. And that is, that is true. Uh, but though the doctrines of the gospel can be elementary, they are also essential. There's something that we need to know, something that we need to have a firm grasp on in our day. The doctrines of the gospel are under attack. They are under attack like never before. Obviously, they're under attack from the world. Uh, the world hates Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to the world, they didn't receive him. They killed him. They hung him on a cross. And the same thing is taking place today. When Jesus is preached, people sneer and they, uh, and they pull away and they mock and they, they disregard anything having to do with with Jesus Christ. They, they don't want the gospel. It, we're being attacked from the world. The, uh, the, the so-called Christi Christian realm, even in, throughout Christianity, the doctrines, the simple doctrines of, of the gospel are under attack. Having a conversation with somebody a few weeks ago, uh, this person looked at me, well, it was, it, it was, uh, it was on a, a polo thing there, but he looked at me and he said this about the gospel. He said, we are not supposed to tell sinners that Jesus died for them. He, he looked me in my face. He said, we are not supposed to tell sinners that Jesus died for them. That's not the gospel. There's a whole lot of people who believe that. That is actually, if we were going to uh, look around at the different doctrinal positions concerning the gospel, that would be the fastest growing. There are more Bible colleges, there are more seminaries out there teaching people to go out and preach that Jesus died for our sins is not a part of the gospel. We need to fight against that. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, that, there are some things the book of Jude says that we are to earnestly contend for the faith. And so I, I rather enjoyed being able to put my doctrinal gloves on and punch that guy in the face. Amen? Because that's not what the Bible says. I don't care what you say. The Bible says that the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So that's the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day. That's what Jesus did. That's the good news for all of us. That's what we should shout about. That's what we should be excited about, is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day. And that's something worth fighting for. There are people who would say that about the gospel, that Jesus did not die for all men's sins. There are some, on the other, end, on the other hand, who would teach universalism. They would say that, well, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, which we would agree with that, but then they would say that means that nobody goes to hell. All sins are already forgiven. That, that there, there, there's no need, nobody goes to hell anymore. Jesus already paid for every man's sins. And that's why they go around and preach grace, but they turn the grace of God, that is a beautiful thing, they turn that into lasciviousness. They turn that into sinfulness. They preach the grace of Christ as a license to sin, and that's not scriptural. And so there are ditches on both sides of the road here, right? Well, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to keep it between the lines of the Word of God and preach the gospel as it's related to us 
in Scripture. And so uh, that's something that is, is taking place in our day. I certainly believe that we are living in the last days. We're living in the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1 says this. I'm going to read a few verses here, but listen to this. See if this doesn't describe our day. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. This is a long list of really bad things, right? But I'm, I'm looking outside and I see all this stuff. I see all of these things on full display. Uh, it says they're going to be traitors. They're going to be heady and high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Watch this, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Let me ask you this, what is the power of godliness? They have a form of godliness, but the verse says they deny the power thereof, meaning there is a power that is connected to God. There is a power that is connected to godliness, and these men, they, they don't like that. They deny the power thereof. You say, well, what is the power of God? Look in verse number 16. Verse number 16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. So they are, they are denying uh, the power thereof. They're denying the gospel thereof. They're denying the gospel. And so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to preach and to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're saved and a message on the gospel bothers you, you're probably not right with the Lord. You should, get it, you should be excited about it. And listen about this. Well, there are a lot of people who would say, well, I know the gospel. I'm already saved. Well, how are you at communicating the gospel? You know how I, how I began to grow in the ability to communicate the gospel? I'm not perfect at it. I wouldn't even say I'm great. But, but I, I try to communicate the gospel. You know how we do that? From hearing the gospel communicated. Amen? The more you hear something, the better you would be at communicating that truth. And so when we come to church, we shouldn't just come and always look for something new and for something to spark our interest and something uh, to make ourselves feel smart or important. We should be able to preach the simplicity of Christ in such a way that the people, not just the preachers, the people, not just the teachers, everybody could leave here and communicate the gospel in such a way that somebody could get saved. So when we hear gospel preaching, we should not just think, well, I'm already saved, so I don't need to listen to that. No, you should think, can I communicate that gospel to somebody else? There are people on your job. There, there are family members. There are neighbors, the people in the community that you're going to run into, and it is essential that you are able to communicate the gospel to them. And Paul said that he was separated unto the gospel of God, essentially saying, I have given my entire life I have given everything that I am to the gospel. What have you given your life to? What have I given my life to? There's a whole lot of options. There are a whole lot of choices available. You could give your life to all kinds of things. Paul said, I'm going to separate myself. I'm going to give my life to the gospel. And when he says that he's separated unto the gospel, I'm sure you've heard this preached, it doesn't just mean that he's separating. Uh, most people, when they hear separation, they think separation from the world. And I believe that's right. Amen? But we shouldn't just separate ourselves from things. We should separate ourselves unto things. Brother Sam did a tremendous job mentioning that uh, in Sunday school this morning. He got ahead of me, so I'm a little mad at him. Amen? Started preaching on what I was wanting to preach about. But that's true. It's a lot easier to list all of the things that we don't do than it is to list all of the things that we do. Amen? It, actually, the list of things that we don't do is a longer list. And it probably sounds more impressive. I don't do this. I don't go there. I wouldn't say that. I have this long list of things that I think make me spiritual. And that's not true. What about the list of things that we should do? We're not just separating from the world, we're separated unto the gospel of God. So we should make sure that we're separating not just from the world, but to something. This verse that I've read, I began to read, verse number 16, is packed with gospel truth. Packed with gospel truth. I want to preach for just a few moments on the gospel of God. And I want to bring out seven things very quickly 
seven things that are found just in this verse, verse number 16, that have to do with the gospel of God. Everybody all right? Yeah. Let's look at verse number 16. Verse number 16. First of all, I want to say that this is a personal gospel. Verse number 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I want you to see the word I there. And much like we started this morning in Psalm 23 with the Lord is my shepherd, and we talked about him being a present shepherd, the same principle applies here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I've already preached around it a good bit this morning. But this verse is saying that, saying that I am not ashamed of the gospel, meaning that the gospel relates to him individually on a personal level. Are y'all with me? The gospel relates to him individually on a personal level. What's the verse that we love to read? John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's a wonderful verse. But when we quote that verse, do not disassociate yourself from that verse. When we say that Jesus died for the world, that's 100% true. But that world includes you specifically. And a lot of times we lose sight of that. Do not lose sight of the fact that Jesus died for you specifically. It wasn't just a general thing for everybody, which it was. But it was a specific thing that applied to you. Jesus died for Brother Drew Wannon individually. Je Jesus died for me individually. He died for you, fill in the blank, your name, individually. A lot of people have self-esteem problems. They think, well, I just, I'm not worth anything and I don't belong. When you start considering the fact that Jesus died for you individually, that Jesus died for me individually, it will change our life. It will change our life. Don't look at the cross and just see Jesus dying for the sins of the world. Look at the cross and see Jesus dying for your sins, the sins that you've committed individually. It's a personal gospel. Amen? And when it gets personal to you, you'll start to care about it. You care about things that are personal to you. When, preacher get, when a preacher gets up and preaches a message, and it's just kind of painted out broadly and generally, you can take it or leave it. But when somebody looks you in your face and says your name and says something to you, it moves you in a different way. Isn't that right? Well, we should, we should hear the gospel. We should hear that God so loved the world that he, that he gave his only begotten son. We should hear that verse specifically addressed to us. It's a personal gospel. I believe that in Matthew 18 we have this parable. The Bible says in Matthew 18 verse 10, listen to this verse, Take heed that you desire, or that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that the angels of heaven do always behold the face of the Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. That was you individually, specifically. Verse number 12, listen to this. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray. Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? I believe on the authority of that verse that if I, listen, if you were the only person who would have gotten saved, I believe Jesus still would have died for you. I believe he still would have. That verse says that he leaves the ninety and nine because he loves you. Somebody should say amen right there. I do. Amen. I'm thankful for that. It's a personal gospel. Secondly, it is a pride-inducing gospel. Verse number 16 again. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. When I say pride-inducing, I mean it's something that we should be proud of. And that word pride obviously has a negative connotation when focused on ourselves, but when it's focused at Jesus Christ, it's perfect and in order. Amen. We should be proud of our Savior. We should be proud of him for what he's done. We should be proud of him because of who he is. He, he, he's, he's given us no reason to hang our head when it comes to Jesus Christ. There's no reason to be ashamed of him. You drive down the road, it's interesting to me, when you're driving down the road, how much you can learn about somebody from looking at their vehicle. For some reason, people want you to know everything about them that you possibly can by looking at their vehicle. You can look at the back glass and see how many kids that they've got. They got the little stick family, right? They'll let you know how many dogs that they've got. 
They'll let you know uh, where, they, where they overpaid to get a college degree. Amen? They'll let you know that. They put that on there. Uh, they make sure they let you know if they're a conservative or an idiot. Amen? They'll put that on there. Uh, they put, they want, they'll put all this information that they want you to know. They think it's very important that you know the person driving this car likes this football team. Amen? And they think that's really important. And you just couldn't, you couldn't drive by without knowing that I like this particular basketball team. You need to know that, so I'm going to put a sticker on my car to prove it. Amen? I'm a Costa man. I'm not an Oakley man. I'm going to put it on my car. Make sure the whole world knows. Why in the world do we get proud about silly things like that, but we're too ashamed to bow our head in a restaurant and pray over our food? Somebody might see. You don't care that they know that you like Carolina football or Clemson football. Amen? You don't care if they know that. But God help you if they find out you're a Christian. Listen, Jesus hung his head on the cross and died for me. I'm going to bow my head and pray over my food. Amen? I'm not ashamed to do that. I'm not ashamed to do that. Jesus has done so much for me. He wasn't ashamed. The Bible says that he's not ashamed to call you brethren. He's not ashamed to be associated with you, and you don't deserve it. Right. Listen, I'm sure many of you are probably a little bit ashamed to be associated with me. Amen? And if you knew me really, really well, you'd be very ashamed to be associated with me. But Jesus knows me better than anybody, and he's willing to be associated. He's willing, he's willing for me to call myself a Christian and to bear his name and to make that tie public and to let everybody know that I love him and that he loves me. Why in the world should we live this life ashamed of the one who's proud of us? He's willing, he's, willing to, he's willing to be associated with us. We should want the whole world to know that we're associated with Him, that He has saved our souls, He's forgiven us of our sin, and we're Christians, and we're proud of it. Amen? We're proud of it. And again, by the way, that's the only thing that we can be proud of. It's Him. That's the only thing that there is to be proud of. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 14, this verse is really special to me. I preached on this verse, I believe it was in October of 2019 when I uh, was licensed to preach here in this church. Galatians 6, 14 says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, God forbid. Like God, you, you do, not, do not allow me to glory or to brag or to boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. He's saying, I've got something to be proud of. Amen? You do as well. So it's a pride-inducing gospel. Thirdly, it is, this gospel is provided by Christ. Look at verse 16 again. It says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Watch these next two words. Of Christ. I mean, this gospel is provided by him. That word of, it denotes production. I remember my math teacher teaching me that. Amen? And the word problems. When you see the word of, it means multiplication. It means there, that something is being produced. When this, the fact that this gospel is of Christ means that it is provided by Christ. It is produced by Christ. Without Christ, there is no gospel. Without Jesus, there's no good news. There's nothing to be excited about. There's nothing to be happy about. 1 Corinthians 15 says that we're of all men most miserable if there's no living Savior today. But because Jesus is alive, because He's provided for us salvation, we have good news. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, I already quoted this verse a moment ago, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Who died for our sins? Jesus did. He provided it. According to the Scriptures, and that He was buried. Who was buried? Jesus was. He provided it. And that He rose again the third day. Who rose again the third day? Jesus did. He's the one who did what was necessary. He's the one who has provided salvation for us. This gospel is provided by him. This gospel is powerful. Look in verse number 16 again there in the middle part of the verse. It says, For it, referring to the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I don't speak Greek. But there's a word here. This word is, is supposed to be called dunamis. This word for the word power. And it's supposed to be where we get our word dynamite from. When it's talking about power here, it's talking about dynamite. Dynamite power. Explosive power. You know how this country was built? Dynamite. Dynamite. This country was built by the railroads, right? 
How did all those rebels, how did they, what did they do? They moved mountains with dynamite. I mean, completely, it just explosive power that changed the topography of the land, changed the mountains, made, made a way where there wasn't a way. Uh, dynamite was used to do that. Dynamite was used for me too. Amen. Yeah. The dynamite power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It exploded in my life. Listen, when you got saved, the power of God was so real, it was so powerful that it changed everything about you. If you've been saved, you've experienced the power of God, and that power of God is like dynamite. It just messes everything up. Amen? It messes up all things you wanted to do, all of your hopes and dreams, all of your uh, sinful aspirations, everything that you thought you enjoyed, all the people you used to hang out with, all of the sins that you used to be involved in. With the power of God came, when the gospel of God came, it just blew everything up. Amen? Now, it was better afterward. Thank God for that. It's better now than it was. But the gospel made a big change you, in your life. Yes, it's made a big change in my life. <laughs> yes. It was so powerful that it reordered everything about me. It reordered everything about my today. It reordered everything about my eternity. It, as I said this morning, it's the climax of your life, the moment when you get saved. There are some things in your life that when you are telling stories, you'll say that this happened before and after that event. Right? The, an event in your life that is so uh, earth shattering, if you will, it just changes the, the whole history of your life. And you'll say, This happened, wait, was that before or after that moment? I remember most of y'all remember my Nana. And she would constantly say, Well, that was before I got saved. Y'all remember that? We'd see pictures and stuff around the house, and I'd say, Nana, why in the world were you wearing that? What is wrong with you? And it wasn't when she was, it, it, don't, she was a younger lady, all right? That's what I'm saying. Don't get any bad ideas, all right? So you'd, you, you'd hear something about something she did, and she'd tell some story. I'd be like, Nana, what in the world? What, where was your mama? Like, what were you doing? And she would say, well, that was before I got saved. You know what that meant to her? That her salvation story was so powerful. It was so life-changing that everything else in her life revolved around whether or not it happened before or after she met Jesus Christ. And that's how it should be for you. Amen? It should change your life in such a way that it alters the course of your history. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse number 12, it says, But as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's a powerful gospel. It is a productive gospel. I'm almost done. Are y'all with me? Look in verse number 16, on the middle part of the verse there. It says, for it is the power of God. The next two words, unto salvation. So it produces something in us that was not there before, eternal life. John chapter 3, verse number 16, we've already read a bunch of times, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What we are trying to convince others to do is to receive everlasting life. We're trying to convince them to receive freely what they already want. Why are we hesitant to give the gospel when we're trying to give them exactly what they want? Isn't that what everybody wants? Everlasting life. They want to live forever. We, we have that to offer. The gospel of God is unto salvation. When we preach the gospel of Christ, listen, it's not uh, just enough that we've been saved. We should want other people to receive this salvation that we've received. We should want this salvation to produce something in their life that was never there before. We know the verse, if any man be in Christ, he is what? He is a new creature. Meaning something has been produced. Something new has shown up that wasn't there before. And that new thing is salvation. It's everlasting life. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is that which imparts to others everlasting life. God's powerful gospel will make you and I what we never were before. It did that for me. Amen? It did that for me. This gospel is powerful. It's productive. It is pertinent. The next phrase there, and there's going to be a whole lot of people, if anybody, probably not here, if anybody were to ever watch this, or I'm not sure how that would even work, but if somebody here is listening... Uh, or if somebody listening online or in the future or whatever doesn't like these next three words, I want you to listen very closely. I'm going to say them real loud to upset you, okay? Let's look at it again. 
unto salvation, watch this, to every one that believeth. It's to everyone that believeth. Meaning the gospel is pertinent, right? It's, it's, it's relevant. It's pertaining to everyone. Everyone can get saved. Everyone can get saved. Because this verse says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone. Who's the gospel for? Everybody. Amen? It's for everybody. It's for the worst person you know. It's for the best person you know. It's for the poorest person you know. It's for the wealthiest person you know. It is for everyone. It's been said here before, you cannot give the gospel to the wrong person. You can't. And that was the hang-up. I began preaching this uh, tonight, and I talked about somebody who said that, well, we can't go around and tell everybody that Jesus died for their sins because they believe in something called Calvinism, which teaches limited atonement. And limited atonement is that Jesus did not die for everyone. That the gospel is not for everyone. I don't know what they do with this verse, that it says the gospel is unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Meaning that whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely. Right? Uh, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus wants everyone to get saved. Everyone. Now, who gets to experience that power? We just read the verse. Are y'all still with me? Yes, sir. John chapter 1, verse number 12. Yes, For as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The power of salvation is not limited by the blood of Jesus. It's not limited by his atonement. It's not limited by his work on the cross. It is limited by your belief. That's what it's limited by. It's only limited by your belief. Meaning that Jesus died for you. If you're here tonight and you're lost, Jesus died for you. Jesus did everything to save your soul. But if you don't believe, then that power will not be experienced in your life. You have to believe. But when you do that, when you receive Him, as, as John chapter 1 verse 12 says, when you receive Him, you receive the power of the gospel. And it changes your life. John chapter 1, verse number 9 says this, that that was the true light, talking about Jesus, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I believe that anybody can be saved. Because the gospel's pertinent. It's available to all. This gospel, you say, well, how do you get saved then? How, how do you receive him? It tells us in this verse, to everyone that believeth. This gospel is procured by faith. Meaning when you place faith in Jesus Christ, you receive this gospel. You receive the power of God unto salvation and it saves your soul. I sure love hearing about people getting saved. Don't you? I love hearing about people getting saved. I love seeing people get saved. It just it stirs something up in my heart and in my mind because I remember when I got saved. And how, and how monumental that was in my life. And for me to see somebody else receive Jesus and to see somebody else uh, 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 get saved and experience that forgiveness of sin and the righteousness of Christ being given to them, when I see that, it just makes me happy. Amen? It makes me happy. The Bible says that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. So it's a good thing when somebody gets saved. Gets saved. But all they have to do is believe on Jesus Christ. And for a lot of people, they can stumble at that. That's way too simple. That's way too easy. Surely I've got to, I've got to crawl on broken glass. When I think about what I've done, I've got, I've got to get on my hands and knees and crawl up some cobblestone path, or they'll do like they do in the Philippines, and they'll, they'll flagellate themselves, and they'll whip their backs, and they'll crucify themselves, and they'll try to, try to offer some sacrifice to God for their sin, separate and apart from what Jesus has already done. That's not what Jesus wants from you. That's not what God wants from you. The sacrifice of good works that you could offer can never take away your sin. Baptism can't take it away. Church membership can't take it away. There's no amount of good works that we could produce. What, what pleases God is faith in His Son. When you receive Jesus, you're saying that Jesus, you are enough. 
Jesus, what you've done is sufficient. And when you place faith in Jesus Christ, it pleases God more than any amount of lifetime of work that you or I could do. Nothing pleases God like Jesus Christ. And when you and I can see that, then we can be saved. Acts 16, verse 31, that Philippian jailer comes down and falls before the feet uh, of Paul and Silas, and he says, uh, what must I do to be saved? And they responded and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. When you believe on Jesus, listen now, that's all you have to do. Young people, are you listening? Are you listening? That's all you've got to do. Jesus has already done everything. Jesus did it all for you. You don't have to do anything. It's not up to you. Jesus did all the work. He did all the work on the cross. He did all the work when he rose again the third day. Y'all believe that, right? Jesus rose again from the dead. And because he did that, all we have to do is ask him. Just ask him. He's done it all. All we've got to do is believe. It's to everyone that believeth. And when you believe on Jesus Christ, you're as saved as you could possibly be. You are eternally saved when you believe the gospel. And lastly, and we'll be done, this gospel was prioritized. Look at the last part of the verse there. It says that it is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now I believe that this verse is teaching us that the gospel was first preached to the Jew When you read the book of Acts, you read chapter 2 through chapter 7, you see that this gospel was presented to the Jewish people. It was first to the Jew, but now I believe it's also to the Greek. Meaning, it's for everybody. It's for everybody. And we've dealt with that. Amen? Salvation is for everyone. Mark chapter 16, verse number 15, the Bible says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. To every creature. Every creature needs a what? Needs a preacher. Amen? Every creature needs a preacher. And Romans 10 says, How can they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how how can they hear without a preacher? What are we supposed to be? Preachers. Preachers. We're supposed to go out with that gospel that has saved your soul and preach that gospel to somebody else. I asked you at the beginning of the message, I said, Can you communicate the gospel. If I were to, I'm not going to, but if I were to ask you, say somebody comes over here and they're praying and they're needing to be saved, could I ask you to go and to pray with that person and to tell them how to be saved? What if somebody on your job tomorrow looked you in the face and says, what do I have to do to go to heaven? I hear people talk about heaven all the time and you say that you're a Christian, so how could I go to heaven? What happens a lot of times is, and I'm, sorry, I'm afraid it could have happened tonight, is that somebody will hear that the gospel's being preached and they'll tune it out and say, I don't need that. I've already got that. The gospel's for saved people. The gospel's for saved people. And if we as a church, listen to me, I'm almost done. If we as a church are not equipped to go out and preach the gospel, what kind of a church are we? What kind of a church are we? You know what Jesus said, what kind of church we were? He said that ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? He said that it's good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. I don't want to be a good for nothing Christian. Amen? And if the salt has lost its savor... Meaning if the salt has lost its preserving qualities, if Christians don't have the ability to go out and preach the gospel, that verse says it's good for nothing. I don't want to be a good for nothing Christian. Amen? I want to be able to go out and preach the gospel. I don't want to be ashamed of the gospel. and We should not be. Amen? And at Resurrection Baptist Church, we're not going to be. We're going to be focused and centered around the main thing. We're going to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ.